Andrew Ross from Global Garden, looking at the perspective from the city and the investment community here. And in particular, it's a question for Warren. Um, I'd like to understand more about the way that natural capital methodology and valuation on resources could be brought in to play a much more effective role here in understanding the economic values that are at risk. The reason you mentioned in your presentation for the lack of investment by pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and others is a lack of metrics, a lack of data in a very simplified form that could tell the story. And in your outline on the growth of mega cities, there's a really important underlying valuation problem here, which is essentially a political one as well, because it's utterly catastrophic to be piling billions of money, aid money, into development projects that are looking at the growth of mega cities and eradicating poverty in the course of doing it without putting a valuation on the forests, the water supply, the pollination services, and the entire ecological infrastructure on which those cities depend. Now there's a role for government tenders, for city tenders, looking at the dams, the hydroelectric power schemes, the investment in the forests, in particular, on watersheds, on which this growth absolutely fundamentally depends. And here's the way in which an economic value on that natural capital could be brought into how the city is looking at investment. It's certainly the way the pension funds are looking at it because they're now seriously alarmed at the way in which the investment they have in FTSE 100 companies, the supply chains for Tesco and Sainsbury's and Unilever and RTZ are all now becoming rather vulnerable. And the pension funds know this but those individual companies have no control over the source of the materials that underlie their supply chains. So here you've got a real investment quandary of how to put the funding into the growth of megacities, the, the dams, the hydroelectric power schemes, the transport, the food, the energy, all of which is still dependent on an ecosystem behind that city, which has got zero valuation. So there's the role for the, the Teeb for Business Coalition and others here, but it's essentially a World Bank problem or a major development agency problem to begin a valuation of natural capital. And I'd really very much welcome your thinking on that. Thank you. Warren, do you want to take that one? Straight sure. off. Sure. No, it's a it's a great point. Uh, in fact, the the uh, I would argue about the that perhaps the most important thing that came out of the Rio Plus Twenty discussion was a a strong focus on on natural capital accounting, uh, which implies valuation first. Um, and in, and you know the the World Bank. I'm proud to say started a program called Wealth Accounting and Value. Uh, Evaluation of ecosystems, and ecosystem services, waves, which is really all about how to help governments that are interested in this 
look at their natural assets uh, and build that into accounting, a, a much smarter way to go than GDP. Um, the, the challenge is that very few countries are actually taking decisions based on that kind of valuation and, and accounting uh, in terms of making short-term versus long-term decisions on how they use those natural assets. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Uh, at the city level, I, I agree with you. I think that there, there are a number of things to be looked at. And there, there's progress in some places looking at linking uh, ecosystem services from forests to water supply, valuing that, uh, getting some kind of payment up to watershed protectors. Uh, particularly in Latin America, there's been a lot of progress in that area. But at a large scale, uh, that, that hasn't happened. And uh, so I think it's, I think it's uh, work in progress. There's a, and and I, I wouldn't just emphasize megacities. I think you know, we're going to, the, the biggest growth in cities will be cities between one and five million populations uh, over the coming uh, 30 years. And so, and a lot of these are going to be relatively new cities. So there's actually an opportunity to shape these cities in a smart way. Um, but there's a huge amount of work required. Just, just really valuing ecosystems and ecosystem services is still nice to talk about. Very little that's done on the ground. So there's a huge amount of work to be done still. And, and that work has to be done to convince traditional economists that this is a smarter way of, of actually understanding your economy and your wealth than uh, traditional GDP. But certainly there's progress. Now on the pension funds, I, I actually I agree with you. The people we talk to, they are worried. But my concern is that, that the decision isn't to, to look at the vulnerability of investments to climate impacts and so on and say, we need to do something about this. The decision is, well, if these are vulnerable, we're going to go somewhere else. You know, a good oil stock uh, is a good, pretty safe place to go right now. And that's what, that's the risk you run. So again, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done with institutional investors to, to help them get engaged in moving the agenda as opposed to doing what they're paid to do, which is to protect the pension fund and, and invest in, in stocks and, and other um, forms of equity and, and so on that are lower risk. And so uh, I actually think there's, the, you know, this is an area where a tremendous amount of work has to be done. And if we don't figure out how to mobilize the financial resources from pension funds and sovereign <coughs> funds and others, we're not going to mobilize the trillions required. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Um, who wants to go next? Any thoughts around the... Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. My name is Nzita. Originally, I am from uh, DRC. And uh, so my question really is, we'll focus on what Mr. Peter Moore has said uh, with regard to the mismanagement of natural resources, the population of Africa, with particular attention to Kinshasa, the issue of human rights and democracy. I'm a bit baffled by the, by the comment of Mr. Uh, Moore. Because if it's come to DRC, the main responsible for the mismanagement of Congo is the Belgian government. It is the Belgian government who put Mobutu in power. It is not the Congress people. You keep in for 32 years. You never criticize him. You never do something about him. So now, the natural resources today, the Congo is experiencing one of the worst catastrophe since the Second World War. Around six million of people have died. Why? Because you want Belgium and same Western countries want to give the eastern of Congo to Rwanda and Uganda in order to control the coltan. 
And this, you didn't say anything about it. Corruption in the DRC. I myself has a young boy after my primary school. In secondary school, I experienced corruption not with the Congolese, but with the Belgian. Let me give you a specific example. A friar will pay fees, for example, for one hundred dollars. He will give us a receipt, a receipt of fifty dollars. I will go to oh my friend, but uh, what is this? I just, I go, uh, go away. So we couldn't prosecute him. Why? Because the chief of education services was his former pupils or student. I want to see Frere one not the friar who put Mobutu in the army, that Mobutu today was a president. I explained him. He said, it is not your, your business. We learn corruption from you. And myself, I experienced corruption of, uh, between Belgian, between the Flemish and the Wallon in Congo. So now, in terms of population, you raise the issue of Kinshasa being the, I think, the second uh, mega city in Africa. Why Kinshasa is becoming a mega city? Because the people are running from the Eastern Congo. They can't go back to the Eastern Congo. And who is responsible? It is you, sir. You have to recognize this. Because you have made a grievous mistake in Belgium when dealing with Congo. Now, issue of human rights. We had election in 2011. Joseph Kabila did not win the election. Even the Financial Times here, he, the Financial Times concluded that this time, Joseph Kabila, we should not get away with corruption, uh, no, with fraud. Your king and queen went to Congo. Why? So, to listen to you here, to give the example of DRC, had the bad example of mid uh, mismanagement, it is, it is a propaganda. And I reject all your intervention uh, in relation to DRC. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Peter, I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond directly. Uh, thank you. I, I'm not going, uh, that is an opinion that I respect, and I'm not going to enter into a, uh, into a discussion. I took the examples of DRC and Burundi for two reasons. First, because those two countries are our main partner countries, mm -hmm. and those are countries that I visit on a regular basis. I, don't, I won't say I know those countries well, but I, I'm in Kinshasa and in Bujumbura and, and other parts of those countries every three to four months per year. So that is why I took the, um, these examples. Um, and, and, and for the rest, uh, I, I would prefer not to start a, a discussion on the, on the historic uh, responsibility of Belgium, which, which I recognize. Thank you. Hello, I'm Anis Kizilbash from Development Post. I'd be interested to hear, Peter, your comments on uh, Romilly's report about how um, traditional donors uh, must compete more. Um, I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that and how will you compete with uh, emerging donors? Thank you. Thanks, Anis. Um, I also have um, some questions now coming through on the line. Um, what role should trust funds within multilaterals play in the future global finance environment? Should non-OECD donors channel aid through trust funds? Um, I think that's probably geared mostly to the World Bank and the other IFIs. Um, and that is from Jisheng Li, a researcher at the University of Birmingham. And a question also from Mariki Hunyet, um, working in the Consortium of British Humanitarian Agencies based in London. Do any of the speakers have any views on how civil society will play a different role in the development cooperation of the future? So um, we'll take those three questions across the panel, I think. Um, 
But I'll start again with Peter because the first question was directly for you. Thank you. Um, you were talking about this possibility to uh, to decide to send a uh, hundred pounds to a family in 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 Kenya, just uh, randomly chosen. Um, I don't think that is part of the future of a traditional development agency, um, because laudable as it may be, uh, it doesn't have it, do it may have an enormous impact on an individual level, but it doesn't have an impact on a on a broader level. It is it it, it it's a form of aid uh, which doesn't drive for change, which doesn't have any structural structural transformational uh, impact, and and so. Although I recognize the schemes, and, and I certainly don't want to, uh, to, to uh, well, I, I think there's a lot of in it, but it's not the way a traditional uh, donor, a traditional development agency should, uh, should work, I think. Uh, competition is a good thing. I'm really convinced of that. Um, but I think that even with the emerging donors, and I've already said emerging donors are neither. They're not emerging. Some of those donors have been donors for, 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 for 30 or 40 years. And you could discuss whether they are donors ba because maybe their, 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 their framework is different, but, but that is of no importance. Competition is good. But let me again, so with your permission, give an example from the DRC. Um, I saw Chinese companies build roads between Kinshasa and Kikwit. That wonderful road. You can now drive from Kinshasa to Kikwit a couple of years ago. You couldn't. Good, good for them and, 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 and a wonderful effort by China. And, and we, we shouldn't try to, to, to compete with them. They can do it better and at lower cost. But if it's about um, supporting local civil society organizations of trying to build capacity in parliament, maybe there we are more, are better suited to do that than our Chinese co uh, colleagues. And, and, and so I see the competition very much in, 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 in a complementary way. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Romilly, do you want to take the question about civil society? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that, and, and maybe just a quick response mm. to, to Peter about this issue about the, you know the transferring 100 pounds. I think the concern is more: will people be prepared, particularly in a context of sort of aid skepticism, aid fatigue, and so on? Will they have the trust that if they put money through Diffid or Belgium or anybody else? that it will actually get to people more directly um, in, in that direct way, whereas if they transfer it directly, they, they know it has got there. Mm -hmm. The thing that comes into my mind, though, interestingly, about your point about sort of structural change is I used to work for ActionAid, where they have a child sponsorship model, which the way it's advertised is you're transferring di money directly to a, a child. In fact, in reality, it doesn't go to the child, it mm. goes to the community, and they use it for exactly that structural change. So yeah. I almost wonder if we may end up with some sort of hybrid model along mm. along those lines but i think that the key issue is is that sort of support for the public aid agency going to d going to maintain mm. uh, it itself in, in future i think the role of the, the the cso's i mean clearly one of the things one of the challenges that we had with this report in terms of the age of choice is we were very much asking governments what they wanted and what their priorities were now that does not necessarily equate as i think you alluded to peter to maximum development outcomes. And one of our case studies was in Cambodia, where actually a lot of the conditionality that the government is saying no to is around land rights and around human rights, which are things that you would think are, are perfectly sensible areas for donors to have a dialogue with the, with the government on. So I think that in this situation where actually donor, uh, traditional bilateral <coughs> donor conditionality is likely to be less effective, actually the voice of the civil society needs to be more effective. They need to be able to challenge their governments and hold their governments accountable more effectively. And perhaps one of the roles which we haven't talked about for the traditional donors will be to, to support CSOs in, 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 in doing exactly that and, and, and building up that, that accountability. So I, I see that being the, the biggest role going forward. Okay. Thanks, Romilly. Um, Warren, uh, trust funds, which have been, I think, growing very rapidly in recent years, mm -hmm. at least with the World Bank. I'm not sure about other IFIs. Yeah, I'd, I'd also like to comment on the CSOs sure. in a little bit different way. Um, first off, I you know until um, at least multilater multilateral development banks, uh, until we have mechanisms to uh, use our own balance sheets to raise funds for actions at the regional and global level, uh, we will continue to rely on on trust funds in a big way. Um, 
and, and trust funds have played a, an extremely important role in our ability to, to address uh, issues other than country-owned, country-driven, uh, particularly poverty reduction-focused ac actions. So they're extremely important. Uh, they, um, the interesting thing is that they, that the way that we uh, raise and and govern trust funds, I think, has changed dramatically over the last few years, and and I think that's one of the reasons why they've gotten quite a bit bigger. Um, and I've been around for a while, and, and in the old days, uh, a donor typically had an issue that they were interested in, and, and we were interested in, we got together and they gave us some money, and, and we went and did something interesting. Uh, now, I think what we see is much more of a collective action, both not just on the donor side, but on the recipient side. And on the recipient side, often not just countries, but also uh, could be cities, it could be civil society organizations, it could be uh, a whole range of, of parties interested in the future of the oceans, for example. So a dialogue, much more constructive dialogue takes place in developing the partnerships that, that trust funds then, uh, multi-donor trust funds get behind. So I, and, and the governance of those trust funds is typically uh, uh, very much a balance mm -hmm. now between the recipients and, and the donors and, and other players that are involved, think tanks and others. So I, I think it's, it's uh, uh, a much better uh, arrangement now. I think the impact is much greater. Uh, I would like to see over time, though, uh, the ability for us to not have to rely as much on trust funds to address these issues. Um, you know, on the CSOs, I, I just I think that the advocacy part's important, but I actually see it a little bit uh, not differently. I think that there's an additional major major role that that is already taking place, and I and I think looking at 2025 our study scenario, I think it's going to be more important, and that's the the taking action on the ground. Um, you know, we have. Uh, a good example of, of a program is Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, which is a, a very large biodiversity uh, initiative that's all implemented by NGOs and civil society organizations, many of them established in countries that had a very weak CSO uh, uh, capability, at least in the biodiversity <coughs> and natural resource management field, uh, building capacity and actually implementing major programs on the ground and by doing so dramatically influencing the policy of governments uh, linking into the policy dialogue that the World Bank has so you know this can and, and this was by design it was a it's probably the largest biodiversity fund around and it was by design it all intended to be uh, civil society implemented uh, a question we're asking in our study is is how do you take really good ideas? Greenbelt movement is a good a, a good example. Um, how do you take a really good idea and take it to scale, rep or replicate it? So, in other words, how do you take a greenbelt movement concept and make it grow uh, and cover five countries, or replicate it in five countries? And it boils down really to two things: one is leadership, and the second is fun funding. And, and so I think that what we've got to do a lot of thinking about in, in terms of the long term, uh, recognizing that civil society organizations can do a lot, particularly at the grassroots level, at scale that, that others can't do, is that we've got to really focus on how we build that kind of leadership and then, and then get the funding behind it to, to make it happen. Warren, can I just ask you to be a bit more specific on the earlier point about um, what would need to change for the World Bank to be able to spend its own money on, for example, the stuff that was done in the climate investment funds or that has been done? Well, it, it means two things, uh, and, and neither of these are seriously on the table right now, and right. I think that it, they've been talked about, but they aren't really on the table uh, because we, like the donor community and like the pension fund community are, are risk averse. We like our AAA rating and we don't want to do anything to threaten that. The, the, I think what has to happen is there has to be a, an ability to, to actually raise funds mm -hmm. using our balance sheet and then put that into uh, facilities, uh, whether some kind of instrument that actually is designed to deliver regional and global uh, 
public goods issues. We can do that. We've done it on other issues, um, but but right now uh, that's not happening. And and of course, uh, if the global community would agree on a price on carbon, uh, we could do it really quickly and easily. Um, or if our our you know it, the, our ownership is the global community, if the if that community said this is how we want to to since we aren't able to agree on a price on carbon at, as of today. This is how we want to bridge the gap for now. Mm -hmm. So it, it's certainly doable, uh, but it, but it's it's not going to happen without a, a real global push for it to happen. Thanks, Warren. I think we had a question here. Yeah. Um, thanks. I'm Gary Jenkins. I used to work in the Climate Change Secretariat in Bonn and in DFID. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question for Warren. I was greatly cheered up by your presentation. <laughs> Um, the question is, you, you said that the key to this is mobilizing private money. Do you ha is there any emerging thinking in your project about how to do that? You didn't say very much about, about that. <coughs> and if I can, just a point of detail. Um, you listed a whole load of challenges, food and urbanization. You didn't mention water resources, which used to be a, a top. Uh, uh, bank concern is—is is it still on on your list? Thanks. Thank you very much, Gary. Any others? Yep, Ed. And then. Thanks. A couple of questions. Um, Romilly, just if we take um, the Can country. You introduce yourself. Sorry, Ed Hedger from ODI. If we were following the demand side and the country perspective on the climate financing question, I think you I, assume, I think you covered a little bit in research but didn't have time to present it. We've heard a lot about what, what's needed, what's required. Um, did you find out much from the country level interviews about what the nature of demand for those sorts of sources vis-a-vis -vis the alternatives, what the um, understanding was about the difference or similarity or commonality about those sorts of sources? And then a Third question is maybe pushing a little bit more into speculation, but whether there was, um, if you follow the argument that there is a greater direct access, a greater discretion afforded to countries in using those resources because of the nature of those, whether there is an intent to use them consistent with the sort of purposes that are intended, or whether there's, there's actually just a, a more flexible use of discretionary resources accessible for whatever purposes may or may not be correspondent. Mm -hmm. And that may push you into speculation, if you wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. And Peter, if I could. Pick up. You um, you talked a lot about um, the results agenda, about low hanging fruit, about working in um, challenging, fragile states, um, but also sticking to the poverty agenda. You then talked a little bit about taking greater risk, and I wonder if you could expand on that. What do you mean by that risk? Does that include innovation, experimentation, the ability or the capability to? take risks, learn, but not necessarily succeed through that iteration and progress. The reason I ask is I, I think that seems to be at the heart of what people, colleagues, um, describe as sort of catalytic approaches, but it's also at the core of what seem to be some of the <coughs> least politically feasible approaches from the domestic constituencies of the provided assistance. Um, I think that's especially interesting in the context of a bilateral so-called traditional aid agency trying to hold firm to that agenda to experiment, to innovate. But I suspect it also lies a little bit into foreign territory where innovation around some of these new, uh, new thinking, the urbanization agenda, cities where traditional actors have not historically been some of the core, um, core actors core engaged and where perhaps some cap capacity and ability to innovation would be rather important in, in taking that on. And Warren, if there's anything you want to comment on, please feel free. Thanks very much, Ed. And one last question at the back, I think. Women for Justice and Peace in Sri Lanka. Um, I just want to remind, uh, firstly, that any change is exponential. And it took a few centuries for carbon concentration from 0.02 to 0.03. And it took only decades to come from 0.03 to 0.04. Just now we have it. But uh, just imagine, 0.05, when are we going to have it? Right, that is uh, terrifying. Um, then validity of 
development assistance, we have had it for long, and there must have been a lot of changes, and things have really changed, a lot of changes. It may not be a very good, good changes. Um, instead of donors having foreign policy as, um, or development assistance so much, why not let uh, them develop uh, people who need uh, money, develop foreign policies with, or we have to ask for so much of money, develop this or that. Um, if I am going to so many meetings, all around a lot of places, and a lot of um, uh, South Americans, Asians, uh, Africans I am meeting, they all ask, <coughs> Don't give us aid, give us loans. Nobody is looking at the corruption that is in the southern hemisphere, that is gobbling up um, the aid or not letting poverty uh, be reduced. Uh, when, whenever you look at poverty, you are thinking of, oh, let us give money, let us give them money. No, there are other factors that is uh, causing poverty. Uh, bad governance, uh, corruption, so many other things, uh, they need to be looked at a uh, lot more seriously. And conflict, conflict, uh, people are suffering so much and the gap between the rich and the poor is growing faster and faster, uh, more in the developing world than in the developed world. So you have, to, and I just want to know one more thing that uh, uh, meetings like this, uh, most of these people uh, who are in the panels or here audience are from the donor uh, <laughs> community. So how much, uh, how valid is this uh, type of discussion um, without uh, uh, considerable input from the developing par partners? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I think there was a question there about aid and corruption, a question about conflict, and a question about the usefulness of this kind of discussion, um, which is largely northern focused. Although we do get quite a lot of southern participation on the on the live stream as well. Um, okay, let's have a final set of contributions from uh, the panel then. Romilly, do you want to kick off? Great. Um, thanks, Annie. Uh, just responding to Ed's uh, question on sort of climate finance and uh, and the sort of ownership questions. Um, we didn't really cover that specifically in this paper, but what I understand from some other um, ODI and UNDP research is that actually there's not strong ownership uh, in, in of climate finance at, at country level. It's a real challenge. Um, we found in here, in this paper, that the three countries varied a lot in terms of how they were approaching climate finance, and Ethiopia was particularly expecting to mobilize very, very large sums of money in terms of climate finance. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, uh, Zambia didn't have very high levels of ambition, didn't have a very well thought out sort of strategic plan. It's difficult to know to what extent they are responding to the funding, the changing funding environment, thinking, aha, this is an opportunity for us to raise, to mobilize additional finance, therefore we'll start developing strategic plans. Um, but I think that overall, um, what I understand is that it, it's something that it still seems to be coming from outside, by and large, and it's not a, there's not a big push at, at, at country level um, to, to push on the, the climate change issue. Um, just the point about um, people being from the, the, the donor community, I mean, this was exactly one of the reasons for wanting to do this study, to actually go to countries and, and, and talk to people much more directly about what was their experience of the changing landscape. In fact, when we did the uh, report launch for this a couple of months ago, we had somebody online from Rwanda giving us his perspective, and unfortunately the Skype line was very bad quality. We couldn't hear him very well. But I, I take your point that it's, it's good to make sure that we have that richer uh, perspective in these debates. Thank you very you. much, Romilly. Peter. Maybe on risk, uh, following up on what you said, and I'll come back to the last question as well. Of course, traditional donors uh, have less risk appetite than, than, than others. I hope others have more. Um, political and budget authorities don't like the concept of risk. Um, but I give you three, three things. First of all, if, if a donor like, like, like Belgium decides to concentrate on least developed countries and fragile states, that is already a huge risk. If 
uh, two thirds of our partner countries are those countries. If more than 80% of our country programmable aid goes to those countries, that in itself is risk. If you say we are going to support land reform in South Africa as we do, or justice reform in Rwanda as we do, that is risk. Uh, I don't know whether it's real experimentation, but it is risk, and I can tell you that we really need to explain that to our political and, and, and uh, budget masters very carefully because, because um, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not easy, and, and often those programs fail. Um, um, and then on the, I, I think in my, in my presentation, I talked quite a lot about issues of governance, of conflict, of, of, of corruption. Um, the answer is not, to um, to to walk away, uh, I think, and that is not what we are doing. But the answer is to have very sound instruments and tools whenever you have a problem. And secondly, n also work with local society organisations, with parliament, etc. And not only through government channels. That is something, and I talked about it, that maybe in the Paris principles has not been recognised sufficiently. That we need to to work with the whole of government and the whole of society in, in, in partner countries as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Warren. Yeah. Uh, two, I'll take your second question first on water. It's very high priority and obviously extremely closely linked with the climate agenda So, uh, and the urban agenda and the agriculture and food security agenda and so on. So it's, it's front and center. Um, just as a footnote, I think the, the, the new kid on the block is a serious look at oceans as a more holistic issue, and that, that's about as complex a problem as you can face, and we're, we're working on that uh, with, a, with about 120 partners right now. Uh, mobilizing private money, there, there's, you know, this is certainly not a new discussion. Um, there haven't been any, particularly with the carbon market taking the, the turn it's taken for and the value of carbon, it's made it a much more difficult discussion. So, so the questions really are around how do you package investments at scale um, that actually have a climate impact either on resilience or and or on mitigation. Uh, mobilizing private money is clearly easier on the mitigation front. Um, and so the, what we're looking at now is if you're looking at the urban sector, which is where we believe you can, you can generate a large enough, fast enough uh, uh, program of investments to actually have an impact on GHG concentrations, then, and, and absolutely requires private money, then you have to take a step back and say, what would a mayor want? You know, a <coughs> mayor probably doesn't really care about a low carbon city. A mayor is concerned about meeting the infrastructure and services needs of uh, current population, often under infrastructured already and, and under service. So how do you help that mayor catch up and then look to the future growth uh, that actually builds resilience and low carbon into that? And, and there, so it's a question of how you bundle investments, how you take uh, investments that may have a financial rate of return and possibly cross subsidize so you, you actually justify some of the public or help fi fund some of the public sector investments that aren't being made now. Um, we're looking at a whole range of those issues. So far, uh, when we, in the discussions that we've had with, with pension funds and sovereign funds, the indication is, uh, no surprise, keep it simple, we're focused on a rate of return and low risk. And, uh, and that means the, the bundling is probably bundling investments that like building energy efficiency that you can put together at scale that actually get a return on the investment uh, if designed properly. Uh, this is all work in progress. There are, uh, there are some interesting pilots that are underway right now, but nothing at scale uh, that, that I'm talking about right now. So uh, it's, it is definitely work in progress, and I think that hopefully over the next year we'll see some real progress in this direction. But if, if uh, we could get a price on carbon, that would <laughs> solve a lot of problems. A good price on carbon. That's <laughs> great. Thanks very much. I'm going to draw this to a close now because apart from anything else, I know Peter has to <laughs> run for his <laughs> flight. But um, many thanks to the panellists for three very good and very complimentary presentations. <laughs> thanks to all of you for your questions. <laughs>